Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to our study in the book of Zechariah, chapter 5, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that our minds may be ready and that we may be prepared for the different aspects of this book that we need to be ready to examine. Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for your many blessings through the week that is now past and for the blessings of rest that we may have now. As we come before you, as we join before you, we claim the promise that where two or more are gathered, there you may be also. Now, while we may not be gathered physically, we are gathered by the use of this technology. We ask now, Father, for the guidance of your spirit, that your angels may attend us, that our hearts may be open to learn. Help us now, Father, so that as we open this book, we may be prepared to listen and to learn. Help us to remember whose presence we are in as we come before you. May our worship today be pleasing in your sight. I thank you for those that are joining in this meeting and for those that will view this later. For this, Father, we thank you, and for this we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, last week we began the study of Zechariah chapter 5. What was the main point that we were dealing with in this particular book? When we were looking, when we looked at this last week. Well, we looked at the flying scroll and um, uh, we dealt with its measurements. Okay. Now, thanks to a brother this week, I took a look at the presentation that went on a couple of weeks ago with the American group. I recognize that a point was being made that the situation with July 18th, especially dealing with the numbers of July 18th, caused some heartache with Elder Jeff. Does this mean that we should not examine numbers as we find this within scripture no okay why would we continue to examine the numbers that we find within scripture well people are going to react differently but the message message is still the same agreed still progressing jesus is the wonderful number i mean god is the one who created numbers he uses numbers Mm -hmm. The basic structure of the universe is, is mathematical. And there is no way that what God has shown us regarding numbers could have occurred by chance. You know, and a simple thing would be, um, you know, that most Adventists would accept is, you know, 70 AD for the destruction of Jerusalem is a symbol of judgment, right? So, Obviously, 70 AD is just arbitrary based upon an actual uh, mistake made in determining when Christ was born, uh, believing that Christ was born, you know, in 1 BC uh, or late 1 AD or like late 1 BC or early 1 AD. I'm not sure which how they determined that, but when he's actually born in 4 BC. So. So one is we can see that God uses that number, even though it's an arbitrary number and based upon an incorrect calculation. And and then we also have in Millerite history uh, the symbols of the dates, the first day of the first month, the fifth day of the fourth month, uh, the first day of the fifth month, and the tenth day of the seventh month. And these symbols show up throughout Scripture. Um, But we know from the first day of the first month to the tenth day of the seventh month, the 10th day of the seventh month is the 187th day 
of, of the Jewish year. And if you add up one first day of the first month, 11, plus the fifth day of the fourth month, 54, plus the first day of the fifth month, 15, plus the 10th day of the seventh month, you get 187. Um, you know, if these things are just coincidences, as Jeff said some time ago, the God would be responsible for us um, being deceived by these things because God has put those things there for us to notice. Okay. And, and, and so, so obviously, uh, you know, God put them there. He put them there for a reason to guide us, not to, to, um, deceive us. And, and then we also look at our own hearts. What is it that, that we have been seeking when we've been studying? We've been looking for God's leading and guidance. We haven't been motivated by, you know, evil motives. I mean, God has done a work on our hearts and continues to do a work on upon our hearts in having us trust in him. Um, so the obvious evidence, which has to do with the most powerful evidence, which has to do with the work that happens in our hearts, uh, would give a testimony to these numbers as being significant it, and if we would cast aside july 18 2020 um that would bring a whole question upon almost everything we believe especially even adventism and christianity it, right. it, would, it, it would it would say that there's no basis for any of these numbers and dates and prophecies and so forth that they're all just coincidences um and that, you know, it's founded upon a faulty foundation because Adventism is founded upon time prophecies and numbers and symbols. And so is Christianity. So it, it, it would be, it would be striking at the root of our belief system to reject the symbolic use of numbers and these spans of time and the chronology. Okay. So as I was, as I've been looking over several things based upon what we've considered from our morning studies, I was led to ask some questions. And all of this is going to have to do with what we're dealing with here in Zechariah. Now, in this, in these studies, have we ever seen over the last several years things that have been cast aside by the church in general. Yeah, starting with the 2520. <laughs> okay. Now, if we if we looked at early writings page 74, <clears throat> has the comments of early writings page 74 been cast aside? Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and we did a, you know, in-depth study on early writing 74 and I have written a paper on it. Okay. Um, so, so remember we did extensive studies dealing with that history, dealing with Sister Minor, dealing with the time setting that she's referring to at that time, uh, dealing with the timing of her vision. And, and it was providential that the vis vision being saying September 23rd, you know, the Lord showed me that he shall stretch out his second, his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people, whatever. That's not exact wording, but, um, but that's so, pretty close. Yeah. So, but the thing is, it's not September 23rd, as we found out, it's October 23rd. And so it symbolizes the day after the disappointment. Now, in this case, it's 1850. So it's going to be six years, uh, to the day after the after October 22nd, that she writes early writing 74. And so there was so much in early writing 74, the idea of the daily, the pioneers had the correct view of the daily. So we looked at that. And, and of course, you know, this returning to old Jerusalem, which sister minor is going to do. Um, and then, um, and then the time setting that was occurring at that time you know, for 1851, believing that, It'd be seven years uh, after October 22nd, 1844. Now, of course, they have a misunderstanding of the calendar, so they put it in November for some reason. But but anyway, all of these things together um, really spoke to our time in early writing 74. Well, 
the, I guess the, the point that, that I'm making at this, at this junction in this study, mm-hmm. we've seen that this portion of early writings has been lightly addressed by the church at large. Mm-hmm. Especially when we come down to the, the, the situation that says, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered. Mm-hmm. Now, in this in this presentation that took place with the American group a couple of weeks ago, Brian had brought up some items and had continued to use references from manuscript releases. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that that I was interested in and I'm I'm intrigued by, we have those that would <clears throat> would toss aside a lot of the studies that we've recently done. I remember very well that we went through this to show that this should have been October 23rd of 1850. Yet, if this date was accepted as it is currently written, as we would read this part of the paragraph, it would say, September 23rd, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people and that the efforts must be redoubled in the gathering time. And I believe that's that's a direct quote. I have this on early writing 74 up on, on another screen right now. But I can't. Yeah, yeah, and it's originally in the Review and Herald, uh, the, basically their first edition of the Review and Herald. Okay, so we're referring to September 23rd, 1850, the way this is written. Is that correct? Yep. And that's an important symbol. Okay, so my question, given the tools that we have right now, and given the studies that we have all been participating in, if we're looking at September 23rd, 1850, what is September 23rd, 1850, according to the Julian calendar? It's going to be 12 days. First time I've heard this. Well, this is, this is just part of a study, just part of our conversation. So September 23rd, 1850 is September 11th on the Julian because it's 12 days um, difference, right? So the Julian's 12 days behind, so to speak, right? It's got a catch up so what we're what i'm asking here is if this was 9 11 for the millerites in 1850 and that the lord has showed that he stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people would this then line up with the 9 11 that we have experienced Symbolically. Yeah, symbolically. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons why I believe that 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 typo was allowed, because it was basically a message to us. And and the other thing, of course, we know September twenty third, twenty seventeen, that's when I first present July eighteenth at the at Lambert Church as a symbol of the prediction before midnight, and that's seven hundred and seventy seven days before November ninth, two thousand nineteen. So so that symbol of September 23rd, um, it, you know, and it also has a symbol of 723 because September was originally the seventh month. Um, so, so there's there's that symbol in it as well, um, going back to 723 BC, dealing with uh, the 2520. So there's lots of different symbols that come from the 723 in 1850. So September. my question out of this. Can we set aside September 11, 2001 as being something important in our history? Yeah. Yeah. So it ties us to the past and it ties us to the present. Okay. Which is really what the understanding of prophecy does in the study of the Bible does. It always connects the past to the present. That is a fulfillment of prophecy when we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy. It reflects light back on the past which gives light to those past events that then shine forward into the future 
on our path, right? So it guides right. us. So all of that is contained in this early writing 74. There's so much in that that study that we did on early writing 74. So in this in this type of situation, if these symbols are tying the past with the present, can we afford to set aside numbers when they are giving us these symbolic representations that make these connections? Yeah, because without them, we have no light for our feet. That's the point. Right. And, you know, so I've been looking through and listening to Jeff's studies on Daniel, and there's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah. I mean, what it says about the daily, it's, you know, it's, but there is no new light there. There is nothing that helps us in the present situation. And, and, and at risk of sounding sort of critical too, the one thing that I find in Jeff's writing there, especially on the daily, is uh, the highly rhetorical and negative language that's being used. Because I think it detracts from actually the interpretation to continue to talk about the scholars and how they're basically, you know, incorrect. I don't, I don't think that that actually helps, especially if you're trying to reach people and, and the type of people that will then end up the type of attitude that we end up having, having when we look at things in this sort of critical way of others, um, it, it gives us a sort of a self-justification, uh, the idea that we're better than others. And the reality of what God has been showing us is that we're no different than the church. Right. You know, we have we have a work to do in our lives that we we don't want to do. And and when we focus upon the the faults of others, um, it detracts us from actually doing that work. We start to think of ourselves as better than we really are. And and the whole point of what God has shown us is is to humble man, to humble us. You know, we we may know a lot of things, we may be correct in a lot of areas, but if we're not correct in our Christian character, none of those things really matter. That's correct. Because if we are not willing to allow Christ's character to do, to be developed within us, if we are not willing to allow our characters to be purified, how will we ever give a message as we have addressed in our prior study in Zechariah 4. Mm-hmm. You know, and when we think about light for our feet, you know, generally we're thinking about well, what is that light for, right? Now, you know, God gives us light for our feet because we have to walk by faith, right? He doesn't give us light all the way to the end, you know, so that we can see everything clearly. We have to trust him step by step. Now, when we talk about the advancing light, will that light advance if we don't take a step? No. No, because we have the lamp in our hands. God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And no matter how long I hold that lamp, if I'm standing still, that light isn't going to go any farther, right? So each time we take a step, it's a step of faith and trust in God. Now, If it is true that since 2012, this movement was under a deception regarding chronology, right? So you're going to, you're going to say the first error that really comes in is Ezra 7 9. This becomes this, this error. And we start to look at the symbolic use of dates. That would mean that this movement for, for basically 11 years, uh, had departed from the path. And it gone off into darkness. And, and Jeff was the leader in that. And now he's asking us to say, um, or asking us to listen to him. And, and, and he's saying, you now have to follow me. Well, what we have followed is, is God's word by faith. 
we never really followed a man. And asking us to follow a man now, um, especially a man who says that he's misled us, makes no sense to me. Well, There's nothing in Millerite history that would suggest it. Um, it, it, it abandons, it, it just abandons <laughs> our whole experience, right? I it mean, he, he's asking me to, to say, that my whole experience that I've had in this movement has been a deception of Satan. And, and of course, Satan would want me to think it is a deception of him, but that would be the deception. Um, and I don't see how that's really possible. Um, especially when I consider what God has been doing in my life and how he has been breaking me down as an individual. And and how much I recognize now, and I know I don't see it all, but how far I am from God, how much work has to be done uh, in my own life. And, you know, if that's from Satan, that that makes no sense to me. Satan wouldn't be doing that work. The work has to be that of God. And if and if we can't even discern that that the work was of Satan for all that period of time. How do we have any hope that we can discern that now, right? Agreed. It, it's no. just, it's just an impossibility. The as as we continue into this study, mm -hmm. watch carefully because many times Mrs. White would give us numbers and symbols of the past that would apply to her present and that applies directly to our present. We have been examining the in the study of righteousness by faith, what it truly means to become righteous by faith. But we're also having to study what it means to have the character of Christ. Now, from a non-published document mrs white wrote elder haskell walked over to our place and took breakfast with us and we had quite a profitable interview he requested that we go upon the school grounds and select the place where the building shall be for the church we spent some hours in this work it was not an easy task to decide the most favorable position but we decided to take more than one lot we must have three or four and maybe five. Work will commence on Sunday morning, 22nd of August, 1897. This is a great enterprise for this part of the country. Our school being established here demands that we arise and build. We cannot present to the Lord any meager offering. We want, when this work is done, to have done our best according to the light that God has given. We want to hear from the Lord the word of approval, as did the remnant who obeyed the voice of the Lord, that their God was coming to them through Haggai the prophet, when they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, Haggai 1.14. The word of approval came, I am with you, saith the Lord, Haggai 2.4. Therefore, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts. And a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Zechariah 1, 16. Chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5 are chapters appropriate for our study. We are to learn lessons from these chapters, for history will be and is be being repeated so we have covered Zechariah 2 3 and 4 we are now about to come into chapter 5 we are to learn our lessons from these chapters is that not what she says and this straight was, on okay this was written on Sabbath 21st of August of 1897 now here again then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and beheld a flying roll. Ezekiel 
also had this. When I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. Now, does this flying scroll, this flying roll of 20 cubits by 10 cubits, does it mean anything to us at this time? Well, we know that it, it presents the two 1260s, which is a 2520, if we use the 21-inch cubit. Okay. That, that's the perimeter, not the circumference, the perimeter of, of the, the carpet or scroll or whatever you want to call it. Correct. And, and you have two sides that then have a perimeter of 1260. Okay. Now, Mrs. White continues. When God sends a message to any person, to a minister or doctor, if men pursue a course to make of no effect the message sent, a course that destroys the influence of the message that God designed should make a change in the principles of the one corrected and turn his heart to repentance, it would be better for these men if they had never been born. What does this say to us right now? If someone is going to say that a message that has been sent to them, maybe from the 1843 chart, maybe from the 1850 chart, maybe from scripture itself, and they choose to set it aside, it would be better for them if they had never been born. Is this a, a blunt comment? That's a serious, serious statement. Thank you. Wickedness and deceit remain in the one to whom the Lord in mercy sent his message. But they, through Satan's devising, took it upon themselves to justify and vindicate the one whom God had corrected. And he took it upon himself to refuse the message given and went on, sustained by men who claimed to be the ministers and the doctors of the Lord. Do we have a historical application for one that set aside the message of the Lord? You asked me if you did. Okay. But before Mrs. White became a prophet, there were two men to whom the prophetic message was given. Brother Daniels and Prescott, wasn't it? Well, Brothers Daniel and Prescott were part of those in the in the time of Mrs. White, but I'm referring to the fact that there were two men before this prophetic message was given to Mrs. White. One was William Foy. He continued to accept the message, but he did not become the prophet. What was the name of the other person that rejected the prophetic gift? Hazen Foss. Exactly. And what happened to Hayes and Foss? Did he not recognize that the message that Ellen Harmon was giving was the same message that he had been given and mm -hmm. that he recognized that he himself was lost? Yeah. The one who should have realized his sin and corrected his evil was presumptuous and turned from the messages of God to follow his own course until sin, in deception, in falsehood, in unprincipled working, in underhand dealing became current. Whether there is any hope of a change, we know not. But every soul who has built that man up in his crooked course of action, which they know was not justice and righteousness, will suffer with the transgressor, unless they shall humble themselves before God and show that repentance that needeth not to be repented of. Thus saith the Lord, I am the high and holy one who inhabiteth eternity. The Lord God will be vindicated in the interest he has taken to bring men to repentance, that they should see their crooked ways and turn and be converted. But ministers and doctors have stepped in between God and men reproved 
and have made of no effect the reproofs he has sent, notwithstanding that the warning was to save erring men and turn them from their wrong course of action, that their usefulness should not be destroyed, that they should repent and be converted, and their sins, which are now registered in the books of heaven, be blotted out. Do we have any other mediator save Christ? Is there any man that can stand as our mediator? No, it's not. So this this paragraph, this two, excuse me, three sentence paragraph that Mrs. White provided is quite direct on this subject. The spirit who asked Zachariah, what seest thou? To which he answered, I see a flying roll. Also caused an angel to fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Let no glory be given to erring, sinful men. For the hour of his judgment is come. Here, Mrs. White is combining Zechariah 5.2 with Revelation 14.6 and 7. Many indeed will not understand, but will stumble at the words contained in the roll. Do we wish to understand or do we wish to stumble? Desire should be to understand. All right. In this situation, we also need to consider Manuscript 111 of 1905 because it's presented very clearly in the same way as this letter. Zechariah 5.3 Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. Or if we look at this in the alternate reading. Then he said unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one of this people that stealeth holdeth himself guiltless as it doth. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. Are we to steal from God or from man? Are we to swear by any other under heaven? Certainly not. I will bring it forth saith the Lord of hosts. And it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. If the timber and the stones are being consumed, is this a total destruction? How do you see this? Again, Letter 142 of 1899, Mrs. White presents, Zechariah writes, Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes, and looked, behold, a flying roll. And he said to me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth, over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. The great roll, 20 cubits in length and 10 cubits in breadth, was the measurement of the porch of Solomon's temple. What does this say to us right now? 
is this important? In this role is written the name of the wrongdoer unless he repents of his wrong. The Lord's eye is upon every transaction and his judgment will come upon those who do know, who do wrong. The ninth chapter of Ezekiel should be studied in connection with Ezekiel 2, 1 to 10 and the fifth chapter of Revelation. Here we are in Zechariah. She is combining Zechariah 5 with the ninth chapter of Ezekiel, a portion of the second chapter of Ezekiel, and the fifth chapter of Revelation. Yet the point that I find most interesting is that this flying roll is the name of the wrongdoer unless he repents. So whose names are written on this role? Well, the names of the wrongdoers, so that means all of us. Exactly. For is it not written in Scripture that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Mm-hmm. Does this role... And can this role be tied with the messages of Revelation 14? Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting. You know, Ellen White's making a comparison of this measurement with the porch of Solomon's temple. Right. And so she sees the symbols of these numbers as important. Yes. Right. So she's not following Jeff's counsel. No. No. Now, now, she also mentions Revelation chapter 5. So we know that's going to be the scroll sealed with seven seals. Right. Right. Um, you know, Ellen White quotes that in uh, nine manuscript releases. She quotes Revelation 5, 1 through 3. Um, and then she says, there in his open hand lay the book, the role of the history of God's providences the prophetic history of nations and the church. Herein was contained the divine utterances, his authority, his commandments, his laws, and the whole symbolic counsel of the eternal and the history of all ruling powers in the nations. In symbolic language was contained in that role, the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of Earth's history to its close. And she says, this role was written within and without. John says, and then she quotes Revelation 5, verse 4, verse 5, and 8 to 14. And then she says, the same spirit is seen today that is represented in Revelation 6, verse 6 to 8. Um, history is to be repeated. That which has been will be again. So it's one of the ones where history is be re- repeated. And that's what she says there is that's going to, that the verse is there, uh, chapter 6, verse 6 to 8. I heard a voice in the midst of the four B say a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see thou heard not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth B say, come and see. And I looked, behold, a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So she's specifically referring to the fourth seal, that this history is going to be repeated. Now, when is the history of the fourth seal? I hadn't yet considered that. Okay. So anybody else? The fourth seal, when is that history? That's up to 558. Yeah, and it's going to be part of, of, of what, 538? So, so these are the horses, right? In these seals. Right. right. And so it's going to be as she's actually quoting part of the third seal and then part of uh, the fourth seal. So the end of the third seal and the beginning of the fourth seal. The third seal is the black horse. Uh, the fourth seal is this pale horse, right? Um, Would that be the time of the papacy? 1260 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is the transition between these two histories. At least that's how I understand it. Okay. Now, what I find very interesting, this letter 142 written to a 
Sister W.C. Sisley from Coronaburg, New South Wales, was written on the 14th of August of 1899, and this document was unpublished until 2015. Now, the warning and the admonition that Sister White is giving here is taking a prophetic representation of the numbers, 20 cubits by 10 cubits, and was recording it as the measurement of the porch of Solomon's temple. Mm -hmm. She's giving reference not only to the seven times, but she's giving reference to the third angel's message of Revelation 14. The Lord's eye is on every transaction. His judgment will come upon those who do wrong. We have all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. Do we want our names to be written in the book of life? Or do we want our names to be written so that we receive the mark of the beast? Whose mark are we? Be seeking. We have easy, to make it it was, it's easy to get the mark. It's easy for anybody to get the mark. Sure. To get the seal of God, it takes us some work. Yes, it does. Here we're given choices. When October 22nd, 1844 came and went, did Father Miller repent of the message that had been given? Yeah, he um, is influenced by the people around him. The people that were around him convinced him of what? I think it was about the Sabbath. They convinced him. They convinced him about the Sabbath not being the Sabbath. Right. Were Were these people around Father Miller correct, or were they incorrect? They were incorrect. They were going by their feelings. In all of this, brothers and sisters, what Mrs. White is saying to us right now, we need a deeper study. We need to consider that which is written within Scripture. Does she not tell us that we are to study the word as a miner searching for gold? And that's a poor paraphrase. But is this not the intent that she has stated for us? You said a minor searching? Minor, yes. M-I-N-E-R. Okay. (laughs) As in one... I don't don't think she said minor. I think she said... A minor minor that uh, digs for gold? Right. Yeah. Minor. Okay, okay. I, t- I took it the other way. I took it the other way. <laughs> okay. Now, she has continued from Manuscript 20 of 1899. The parable of the talents represents a most important truth, which all should understand. Now, the parable of the talents, if this is important and all should understand it, does that mean that just a select few should understand it? All should strive to, all should strive to understand it. Right. God has not distributed his talents capriciously. To every man are given abilities which will fit him for the work God calls him to do. There is to be no sleeping at the post of duty. Every soul is to understand that he has a work to do for God. Here, she is giving references to the parable of the talents, to the parable of the ten virgins. She is combining them. Can we not see this? Are we to be asleep today? If we are sleeping, are are we making use of the talents that God has given us? Study carefully the fourth chapter of Zechariah and learn what the two olive trees there referred to mean. Read it carefully verse by verse. For in this chapter, the features of the work in which we are engaged are are plainly set forth. 
Here she repeats again, Zechariah 4, 1 to 6. Our power and efficiency are not in ourselves. We receive them from a higher source. Are we to be reliant upon our own efforts, or are we to be relying upon God for his strength? Now, in this, in the chat, it is noted that we are to be relying upon God's strength. Consider this carefully, brothers and sisters. Consider now whether our names are to be written on the flying scroll, or if our names are to be written in the book of life. Are we to follow what God has laid out, or are we to follow what man has laid out? There will be much for us to consider this next week. Well, man man is always changing. Always exactly. changing and, and feelings and all, all those a lot of stuff, things going on. Right. Do we have any other comments or questions at this time? I hate, excuse me, I muted myself again. I was just wondering whether if Jeff is turning away from, from the, the foundations re, regarding knowing the signs of the times without time setting, is what I'm saying. Could he be like the false prophet in First Kings 13? who started off in, in the correct course and then doubted what God had said because somebody persuaded him to doubt what God had told him to do and caused the fall of many, or potentially would cause the fall of many. It's a fearful thing to ponder. Well, in, in this situation, there have been groups that have come out from the situation from July 18th. The one example that does not wish to be considered by others is that July 18th is the equivalent of October 22nd, 1844. They are currently considering that the midnight cry has not yet come. There is much study that is yet to be done. There is much that is yet to be presented. I don't know how to approach this to answer your question regarding this with Elder Jeff. I do understand that Mrs. White, in many points, has made use of the prophetic example of numbers and applied them both to her time and for ours. Can we in any way set aside what Mrs. White has presented? No way. At the peril of our souls. Nope. Now, question that I the the point that I will I will give you for consideration for next Sabbath's presentation. Is Mrs. White a prophet? And if yes. so, can we show that she was a prophet from Scripture? Yes, we can. Okay. This is going to be what we will address this next week. So I'm giving you the opportunity to be prepared for next Sabbath morning's study. Bring your notes. Bring your thoughts, bring your comments, and be prepared, because we're going to tie this right back into today's discussion and to what we're looking at here in Zechariah 5. Any other thoughts or comments at this time? Shall we, we well, we know, well, we, know she, we know she fulfills at least 10 to 12 uh, in the scriptures. Okay, but I'm going to be asking if individually we can prove this. Can we, of ourselves, show this from Scripture? So shall we now close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you at the close of this meeting, as the Millerites would do as they would separate, I ask 
for each of those that have participated, for each of those for whom we have discussed, that their name may remain written in your book. Help us now so that we recognize where we are at this time in Earth's history. May your will be done. I pray for your blessing upon Theodore and those that will contribute in the study to come. Direct us now, Father. Guide us through this Sabbath. Help us on these things. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.